Hi, you guys. This is Richard Sachs. Welcome back. This is Lost Arts Radio, and we have we're here with our friend Joel Skousen. The uh, if you don't already know who he is, he's a Navy pilot and uh, editor of World Affairs Brief, and the um, author of some books, including The Secure Home and Strategic Relocation, which are really worthwhile to read, and um, also a consultant on anything within those areas of uh, especially strategic relocation and preparation uh, for what what's ahead and we're building up to what's ahead in the series that we're getting near the end of right now and we've been doing a series called the deep state history of the deep state and all the uh, previous episodes are available i recommend that you if you haven't seen them you go back and watch those first to get the context of what we're going to talk about right now and last time we we were in the uh, discussion of building up to the Trump presidency. So this time we're going to go further into the actual Trump administration and and the deep state and all the subjects connected to that. So welcome, Joel, and uh, this should be a very interesting and currently relevant uh, episode. So I'm looking forward to it. Yes, thank you very much. Um, well. To be frank, the the powers that be in establishment did not intend for Donald Trump to become president. And uh, it was viewed all during the campaign as a joke. It was going to be a slam dunk that uh, Trump could never be elected. He was unsuitably president. He was uncareful, talking off the top of his head. Uh, and, uh, and, of course, the Democrats were confident that they could at least skew about 10 percent of the vote through their vote manipulation which has been a long established science that they've developed of, of uh, registering people, whether they're dead or they're felons or other people or illegal aliens, especially, and, uh, you know, using voting, uh, motor, motor voting, motor registration in California and other big states to get people registered without checking their voter ID. They, their control of the courts has successfully blocked any voter ID legislation from the states. Uh, so that you can't block anyone from voting if you, uh, you can't even ask, you know, if you're a citizen now. It's considered, right. uh, you know, racist or uh, uh, denying the poor the right to vote because apparently, you know, they, they can't afford to have an ID that they carry with them. That, right. It's actually hate speech to ask about that. Right. And so when Donald Trump, you know, I was watching that that night, and I'm sure you guys were too, it was amazing to see the the faces of every talking head on the mainstream media just go from enthusiastic about the beginning to cautious and concerned to ashen face yeah. when they realized that Hillary Clinton was not going to make it. And then to see her empty headquarters, you know, where they, she'd spent millions of dollars on major fireworks display and everything to celebrate. And she didn't even have the courage to show up, you know, at this. Right. So, you know, devastated was Hillary Clinton that she was going to lose to someone like Donald Trump. And so it has been war against Donald Trump since, since November of 2016. They didn't even wait until he took office. In, uh, in January, he was on the defensive from the very beginning, and we now know that the FBI had molten, had spies within his campaign trying to get dirt on them. Uh, they were setting up the procedures for, uh, you know, claiming that he would colluded with Russia uh, to uh, interfere with the election. And those are very, very complex uh, deep state operations, and they've been fully exposed. And so we know a lot now more in the public, if you care to read, especially the alternative media, you know, like Gateway Pundit or the Conservative Treehouse or Infowars or um, uh, other sites, you know, you get a real good picture into over time and you've got to be reading these constantly because it leaks out over time. I mean, they started in this Russia investigation with... Um, uh, uh, not with the Steele dossier, which was, you know, a former British intelligence agent with Russia who falsified a dossier claiming that Trump had various relationship with uh, with Russia. It really started with a guy named uh, a professor out of uh, Italy, Misfood, um, who claimed that he was, you know, working with Russia and uh, he got involved with George uh, Papadopoulos, who had just been hired on to the Trump campaign, was working for a London think tank. And another person in the think tank, which was globalist-directed, 
put Papadopoulos in charge of, uh, in, in contact with Misfood, and he met with him in Italy, and he basically set him up to say, you know, look, I can get you meetings with Putin, I can do this and that, and uh, uh, what it was is the deep state had hired Misfood to represent himself as working for Russia, when in fact he was working for the deep state, luring in Papadopoulos to, you know, colluding with him to essentially talk to Russia, get interviews with Russia. So George Papadopoulos goes running back to the Trump campaign, says, I've got all these contacts. I can get you this and that. We have dirt on Hillary Clinton. I can get you this and that. All this was a setup. In other words, you create a false agent providing the lure in there for someone in the campaign. And then you turn around and prosecute the campaign for having uh, a relationship with Russia, where in fact it was a relationship with the deep state. Right. And then Hillary Clinton and the Democratic National Committee, you know, paid for the Steele dossier. They used the Steele dossier to get a false visa warrant to be able to uh, track Carter Page of the uh, Trump campaign. Uh, and they had to falsify the narrative to the FISA court. That was just resolved, by the way. And I've always taught in my World Affairs brief that the FISA court is part of the deep state. It's a covering operation so that it gives the, the image of legitimacy that the, the FBI is going to the secret FISA court to get a warrant to sp do domestic spying. And this court, secret court, is supposed to be covering for us. But it's not even really a court, is it? Well, it is. It has, uh, I mean, they don't do any, any tri trials. It's just a bunch of judges that... Uh, six or seven of them, uh, including a chief judge who's a woman right now. Uh, and they basically rubber stamp anything the NSA or the FBI or the CIA brings in and says, I want a warrant for this. And they give some superficial evidence. But, you know, the judges never ask them, where did you get that particular evidence? That evidence came through domestic spying. So what you're doing is you're presenting them illegal, uh, illegally obtained evidence to get a warrant to go then to legally spy on someone. And if the judges were really working for the American people, they would have said, what's the source of your preliminary evidence? And if they admitted that it was through illegal domestic spying, they should rule it invalid. But they don't. Now, now the Steele dossier actually was, if I understand right, it was actually not domestic spying. It was just fabricated. That's right. That, That's that right. right. Yeah. No, but they used the Steele dossier to show the FISA court that there was some basis for... Trump's relationship with Russia that would justify in further investigating, uh, you know, Carter Page on the on this fact, you know, and right now the the uh, OIG, the Office of Inspector General Michael Horowitz, has whitewashed the FBI's role in spying on Trump, basically saying that they were following all their guidelines. Right. Well, the guidelines said you must have articulable evidence, and all. James Comey, as the FBI director head, was suspicion. In other words, I suspect that there may be something. I don't have any evidence at all. It wasn't articulable in the least. You know, my, my vocabulary is not too bad, but I don't know what that word means. Well, it means that you can articulate the evidence, meaning you can speak about it, you can look at it, you can read it. It has to be something concrete to articulate, do okay. you see? Okay. A suspicion is not articulable. It is not written. It is not factual. There's nothing there except a suspicion. A suspicion leads you to do a fishing expedition, meaning I suspect, so I'm going to go fish around and see if I can find some articulable evidence. So okay. it clearly did not meet the, the FBI guidelines. So his whitewashing of Comey, even though in the latest report by the OIG, he did in fact... Um, criticized severely the FBI for all of these faults. Um, and Comey responded, this was just sloppiness on, on the part of the FBI. Well, it wasn't sloppiness. This was deliberate falsification of evidence before a judge. And what did the chief judge of the FISA court do? She expressed outrage at the FBI this past week, but never sanctioned any of these people, never said they must be prosecuted, never brought them, never held them in contempt. And it's the same thing with Judge Royce Lambert, 
who used to be the go-to judge, cons quote, conservative judge at the Washington, D.C. Federal Circuit that Judicial Watch would always go to present their cases to. And he would always agree with them. He would s say the government has denied and you've got to give them this uh, Judicial Watch this information. And when the government, the FBI would refuse, Judge Lamberth never held them in contempt. He never sent anyone to prison for violating. He would just simply complain about it and demand that they do this and this. But when they would refuse, he would do nothing. Now, this is how the deep state operates when they with controlled judges. They will rule according to the law, but they will not send any of the immunity protected deep state agents to prison for violating that law. Right. So that actually is, you know, the tail end of the story here. Uh, but I want to cover Donald Trump from a conservative point of view, our criticism of Donald Trump from a conservative point of view. Okay. Because I do not believe, as Brandon Smith and others um, have claimed, that Donald Trump is really a deep stater and that uh, he's playing us for fools. I think Donald Trump sincerely wanted to make America great again. But Donald Trump was never a conservative. He always palled around with well-heeled financial people, mostly Democrats, including the Clintons before he was elected president. Donald Trump is a promoter. I mean, he is really not a savvy businessman. He's gone bankrupt three times from, three times from mismanaging his finances. Even though as, as a uh, mogul in the casino industry, in the hotel industry, you've got to deal in New York and big cities. Uh, you've got to deal with mafia-controlled labor unions. It doesn't mean that he's controlled by the mafia because he has to deal with them. Uh, if you're in Las Vegas, you know, everybody has to deal with the mafia controlled casino system and the, and the labor system there. Right. And in fact, most of the big casino owners, including um, Sheldon Adelson, the supposed conservative, you know, are probably, you know, controlled people. But Donald Trump doesn't give you the real feeling that he's controlled. In fact, you look at his loose tongue, his inability to control what he says, and you, you get the real conclusion very quickly. This guy couldn't follow a script if he tried, right. let alone a difficult conspiracy. And the media and the deep state would not be trying to remove Donald Trump uh, so vociferously every single day of his life with if he were really one of them, if he were really a puppet. Now, if he were terrible, he'd be on the cover of Time magazine or something like that. That's right. They always put a globalist on the cover of Time magazine. But Donald Trump is a wild card, but he is a promoter. And so he has a very dangerous innate ability to promote at his rallies. The In fact, the same statements that he's promised all during his campaign, even the same ones that he's failed on miserably to fulfill. He continues to promote them, and his, his, his supporters love it. Now, I have to agree that it is wonderful to hear those promises from a politician. It, gives, it makes your heart leap with joy that someone would actually say it. Right. But in fact, the, the sad truth is he doesn't have the experience or the background or the arguments to defend those positions when they come up against sophisticated advisors who resist and sophisticated lawyers in the White House to resist. So let me go through the, the Trump record here. And I'm going to first start with the successes. Most of Trump's successes have been relatively small uh, that were within his executive power since the Democrats who controlled the House, at least during after the first two years, and the liberal Republicans have combined even when he had a Republican majority in the Senate and the House, mm -hmm. those two, the Democrats with the liberal would block everything that he wanted to do, yeah. including Paul Ryan, the Speaker of the House, who tended to be, I think Ryan started out as a legitimate conservative, but somewhere along the way he got bought out and controlled, and he sabotaged literally everything that Trump wanted to do, especially the funding for the wall. Yeah. Right. Other conservative Republicans said, we have the votes to get the funding, but Paul Ryan will not bring it to a vote. And so this tells you in the deep state that they don't just deal with Democrats. They don't just deal with dark side people. They deal with every Republican conservative that they can control, like John Roberts of the Supreme Court. They let you be conservative, but when they need you to change your vote, like in Obamacare, 
He changes the boat, gets that phone call in the night. Uh, Brett Kavanaugh, as I pointed out, is a deep state individual. He was second in command to uh, um, Ken Starr in the cover-up of the Vince Foster motor. So they'll, they'll use him, let him be conservative for a while, but when they need him to change a vote, they can lean on him. Now, in terms of successes, he did remove the Obamacare penalty. And I might say that was after two years of failed attempts to remove the law itself. Right. He did fail to renew the Chinese lease, the Costco company, that's C-O-S-C-O, -O, not Costco, the, the, the chain uh, discount store. But uh, the uh, Costco Long Beach facility run by the Chinese government, um, he, he f failed to renew their lease. No puppet president would have ever failed to renew the lease of China. Yeah. He's now forcing food stamp recipients with no children in the home to work for at least 20 hours, resulting in a reduction in the rules of an estimated 700,000 on food stamp rules. You have to applaud that. No other puppet president has even tried that. He's making asylum seekers transiting Mexico to wait in Mexico while awaiting a decision on their asylum visas. To his credit, he did try to implement my idea, which I got to President Trump through the offices of Senator Lee in Utah, where I suggested he declare that anyone who caught in the United States illegally is not able to apply for asylum. And he implemented that by executive order, and it was immediately overturned by the controlled courts, which is very, very sad. So it just shows that all of the failures of Donald Trump are not his fault. A lot of it is the deep state, his advisors, the White House, the leakers, the press. And unfortunately, Donald Trump, because he has this particular habit of personality of, of, of being subject to flattery, he dishes it out, too, you know. He talks about lock up Hillary Clinton and how bad Obama was. And as soon as he meets with Obama in the White House, as he became president, he said what a wonderful person he was. Mm -hmm. He even has said how wonderful the Clintons are after he was elected. Um, he has a habit of praising dictators. He's been fooled completely by Kim Jong-un by saying what a wonderful person and believing his promises. Uh, of course, President Kim of... North Korea's thumbed his nose at the president now and said he's not going to disarm at all, ever. And that's embarrassing to Trump. But interesting enough, Trump is so proud about the deals that he makes, and he tends to, to say that every deal that he makes is a wonderful deal. He's a master of exaggeration, of selling something. And once he does that, he will never admit that he was wrong. That's a very great weakness in a president especially in a North Korean situation, and never admit that I was snookered and that I was wrong. He's enrolled back several environmental regulations on coal and oil exploration and freed up U.S. energy production that was not harmful to the environment. He countermanded Obama's burdensome executive order giving federal government control over U.S. waters. That was a big deal. He backed out of the Paris Climate Accords over a year ago, but strangely, he got talked into making the full withdrawal not take place until after the 2020 election when they don't expect Donald Trump to be in there and they'll overturn that. I that. wonder what kind of argument convinced him of that. That's pretty strange. Yeah, you know, it would be nice to be a fly on the wall in the White House and see what they told him and right. how he got turned around. Trump has overseen beneficial reforms in the veterans hospital system, though many problems still exist. One of the major problems is that it's dealing with the medical establishment, which whose protocols and drug right. therapy is a major problem in itself. Yeah. He signed an executive order to help ensure that religious organizations are not choose to force between violating forced to choose between violating their religious beliefs by complying with Obama's contraceptive mandate. Uh, in the Obamacare regulations, and Obamacare has not been officially, you know, taken away yet. So those mandatory contraceptive things for health cares uh, still apply to hospitals, but he's given an out for religious hospitals to not comply with that. So I have to applaud that. Are you talking about contraceptives that include abortion? No, no, this is just okay. contraceptives being forced. You must provide them. You know, if they ask for them, even in 
a hospital that doesn't believe in contraception. Okay. okay. And he removed that. He moved the U.S. Embassy to Tel Aviv, to Jerusalem, in recognition of Israel's historic right to that city, long known as the City of David. Even though I am really skeptical of the government of Israel because of its Mossad activities and its ties to the deep state, right. still I do believe that uh, the City of David is inherently a Jewish city and that they ought to be able to establish the embassy in that city, which they have done. Partial or problematic successes of Donald Trump. Now, sadly, a lot of what Donald Trump, Trump supporters view as a success by Trump is not or was blended by bad compromises. And I put this here because in researching for this list that I'm presenting here, I went through and read some pro-Trump, you know, claiming two or three hundred successes. And they don't understand that a lot of these things that they view as successes, like invading other foreign countries, because conservatives tend to be rah-rah about anything military, mm -hmm. is not a success. It's, it's succumbing to the, the deep state or the neocon influence there. Right. Trump successfully got two mainstream conservative justices on the Supreme Court. All right? that on, everyone brags about that. But neither Neil Gorsuch or Brett Kavanaugh will vote to overturn abortion. So that's a failure of a major campaign promise. Neither is a strict constructionist. Brett Kavanaugh's deep state, as I said, and Neil Gorsuch, though we don't have any evidence of him actually deep state. You've got to remember that every single judge at the appellate level is not truly conservative or, or strict constructionist, meaning they all deal in case law. Mm -hmm. They won't allow anyone on the bench who disagrees with case law. All judges are formed by a establishment judge commission in every state. You just don't climb this ladder, except there being a yes man to case law. So case law means that as soon as there's an unconstitutional decision that gets by, everybody else has to follow it, right? Well, you don't have to, but because everybody has to quote case law, you're going to run up to this, the opposition quoting that. So you have to deal with that. And to overcome case law, you've got to get the judges, and occasionally it happens, to overturn that case or to vote against that particular case. But that only happens about 2 to 3 percent of the time, and never on crucial things to the deep state, like domestic spying or abortion or any of those. You never get these judges to overturn those. Um, what, one question I have to answer at that point is that there was a recent really important case that came from one of the northeastern states and it was being asked to be heard by the Supreme Court because the decision of the lower court was that manufacturers could be held responsible for crimes committed with their products and the Supreme Court said no it's not worth hearing and I think the ones that voted against hearing it may have included Kavanaugh and maybe others that people think are conservative is that true yes it is and that's the major gun, you know, manufacturer liability case, which really threatens to drive a lot of gun manufacturers out of business completely if they're held responsible for the business. Manufacturers of other things, too. That's right. So very, very dangerous. And that's one thing that the Supreme Court ought never to be able to simply not hear a case. They ought to have to quote chapter and verse if they sustain or object to something. Was Kavanaugh among the people who voted not to hear that? Do you know? Um, I, I don't remember. I have got it in my brief, but I don't okay. remember specifically. Just curious, yeah. But Trump has done what no other president would do. He verbally called for the removal of birthright citizenship. An insidious path to illegal entry into the United States by giving birth here. But he backed down after a powerful backlash from the media and turned it over to Paul Ryan in the House, who instantly dropped it and it went nowhere. Now, this is a, a powerful example. I mean, he could have easily proven that this was a legal interpretation. It was never been law. And he had the right to disavow that interpretation. Um, I mean, no other country gives birthright citizenship to people just for dropping a baby in the country. He did a similar thing when he agreed to declassify certain emails the Republicans in Congress wanted for their investigation of the deep state. Mm -hmm. And then he said, I'm going to declassify this, but I'm going to hand it over to Bill Barr, the attorney general, to make the final decision. And Bill Barr, being deep state, never released it. Another guy who was doing a wonderful job. 
com- according to Trump. And and I noticed you also didn't mention anything about getting out of TPP. I'm, or I'm TP- getting to that. Okay, sorry. Okay. He tried to end Obama-era protections for young DACA immigrants, the dreamers, so to speak, living in the country illegally, brought in by their parents as youth. Now they're teenagers and young adults. And then he gave it all away as a bargaining chip, even after the Supreme Court voted that he had the authority to undo Obama's DACA protection executive order. He gave it away and said, I'm going to let them stay. Just wrangles you that he gives away these things just to be popular. He, He is very subject to flattery himself and the lack of flattery he really bends over backwards trying to get back in the good graces so he's not a good president to stand up against peer pressure or pressure of the public he did repair parts of the border wall but failed to secure the border which is not entirely his fault the arrest of ms ms13 gang members has increased in the united states but judges continue to block their deportation Um, I covered in last week's brief as well that there are even private walls being built with private money along the border. And there's an international border commission which required them to put a gate in that wall and padlock that gate open. And they have surveillance of watching hundreds of illegal immigrants come through that gate and get through the border because the International Border Commission established in 1889 between U.S. and Mexico it's now become a UN organization, has mandated that those gates be open for security people to go back and forth. But why have it padlocked open? Why don't you give security people a key to the the lock or something? That's amazing. It's a sham. Yeah. He enacted the corporate tax cut, which was a success, but with the loss of many deductions by individuals, which was not a success. The claim of people filing their taxes on a single sheet of paper applied only to the poor, who pay little or no taxes, and to people who have no deductions. Except for the corporate tax cut, I don't give Trump credit for any of the economic performance. Now, the corporate tax cut did do a lot for job creation and repatriation. I give him credit for that. But you don't give, I don't give Obama credit or Bush or anybody the credit for the economy. The economy is mostly a false balloon being raised by Federal Reserve inflation, an artificial manipulation of interest rates, keeping them artificially low. He does get some credit, I said, for the employment increases by corporations. The White House brags that Trump has got more U.S. Circuit Court judges confirmed in the first year of office, in fact, the first two now, than ever before. However, they're all pretty well mainstream judges, as I said. True constitutional conservatives never get admitted to the bench at all, let alone the advanced higher courts. And most of the appellate judges and Supreme Court judges are directly controlled by the deep state because of dirt that they have on them. For example, Clarence Thomas, the black conservative judge in the Supreme Court, it wasn't just Anita Hill. There are at least five women that he harassed. And they've got that over him. I'm not saying that Judge Thomas isn't a conservative. He does rule, and I think he believes conservative, but he is a, uh, he's got some uncontrolled sexual desires, and they've covered for him, and so they keep him under control that way. So you're saying that any non-compromised conservative person, lawyer mostly, do not become any kind of judge. In other words, get onto what you call the bench. That's right, especially at the appellate or higher levels. There are some, like Judge Roy Moore, who got on the bench early on, a true constitutionalist, look what they did to him. He was literally right. run off the Supreme Court by the state government of Alabama, and uh, they had to manipulate the election to make sure that he didn't win the race for senator. I mean, that's a real telling case of what happens to a true constitutional conservative judge who gets to high position. Was that connected to anything bad that he really did, or was it all made up? No, it was all made up. Okay. Yeah. Okay, um, going back to the border wall, he did secure $1.6 billion for border wall construction in the March 2018 omnibus bill, but at great compromise with Democrats, including continued funding for abortion via Planned Parenthood. Right. With that money, he only constructed a 14-mile section of border wall near San Diego. The border in New Mexico and Texas is still almost totally unprotected. He imposed a 25% tariff on $50 billion of goods imported from China and later imposed an additional 10% on $200 billion of Chinese goods. 
But this imposes, of course, a tax on Americans who pay that, not the Chinese directly. It has not yet produced a trade deal, despite the announcement of the partial trade deal that even announced last week. As I pointed out in the World Affairs Brief, there's nothing written in that trade deal. That's the written text isn't hasn't been agreed upon, and yet Trump announced that China was going to buy forty nine billion dollars of American agricultural goods. Right. But China has never purchased more than twenty nine billion of uh, agricultural goods from America. Yeah, so he said we, the farmers would have to buy more land and everything to keep up with it. But are we really going to believe that China, China? No, China just threw out this figure to get rid of the tariffs before Christmas. And they have no intention of following through. And you won't know that until January when they the handwriting's on the wall. Now, even if they sign a deal, China is notorious for not following through with their agreements. I wouldn't be surprised, and neither do other people like in altmarket.com, that China will buy a few billion dollars of soybeans and corn and then they won't fulfill anything less. And what's the U.S. going to do? Right. To reimpose tariffs, Donald Trump would have to admit that he was snookered. Yeah, and the Chinese, yeah. the Chinese know that Donald Trump is very reluctant to admit failure or that he got snookered by someone. If, so, if I have a question about what you're saying do you want me to wait until you, you're at a certain break point or is it okay no, to go ahead. jump in go ahead. a couple of things i didn't want them to go by too far one is that um you said that to get a little bit of money 1.8 billion i think you mentioned for the a small section of wall that is almost insignificant he had to make concessions such as continuing the funding for planned parenthood his main business is abortion and uh, I'm never clear what is the justification why they get like half a billion dollars every year of taxpayer money, completely unconstitutional. What, what's that based on and why is it not challenged? Well, it's based upon the politically correct notion that they are providing women's services. And, you know, it's like motherhood and apple pie. Plan here and provides counseling and they provide health services and free cancer screenings and mammograms and other things. But look, 90% of their business is abortion. Right. And that's, you know, covered up. But Planned Parenthood is an abortion, uh, you know, factory. A third of a, a third of a million abortions a year or something like that, I think. It's just in this country. A criminal. And you see, I've often criticized Donald Trump. Um, for not using the government shutdown properly. Conservatives continue to be lobbied to have a constitutional convention to pass a constitutional amendment on a balanced budget. But they don't need to. All they've got to do is enforce the current law, which is by majority. It doesn't take two thirds to get this passed. It takes a majority to and the president's signature to, to override the debt ceiling limit. All Trump has to do is say, I'm never signing another debt ceiling extension ever, so get used to it. Get in. And then they shut down the government. They say, well, there's not enough money. We can't agree in Congress on what to fund. And so right. Trump just says, now, I then have the power to use what's available funds. And so I'm cutting off all foreign aid. I'm cutting off Planned Parenthood. I'm cutting off aid to education. I'm cutting off grants, you know, to universities. You know, they would cry holy murder. Right. Because, and they would probably impeach him because so many people are on the hook for government money now. Yeah. Even conservatives that they would say, oh, you can't gore my ox, you know, you've got to let me have my money. But, you know, a, a true conservative could say, look, if it's not authorized by the Constitution, get used to it. Uh, it's not going to get funded by deficit spending. And so you're stuck with what we make. And look, you don't have to shut down the whole government. You don't have to shut down the national parks. I mean, you can cut out the fat and dismiss about half of the bloated employees of the Forest Service, but you don't have to shut everything down. Right. Uh, you can still cut Social Security checks all within the existing budget. Uh, but Trump had the opportunity twice to use the government shutdown to do it correctly, and he failed to do so. It also seems like he doesn't understand what he could have done in the beginning to build the wall instead of arguing with Congress. 
the same military money that goes to build illegal bases in Syria and Iraq and things are just by decree as the commander in chief as if they were legal. Why couldn't the same power be used to say, okay, finish the wall? Well, in fact, a lot of those wall funding in Israel and Afghanistan and other places in Jordan have been funded in the NDAA, the National Defense Authorization Act, which is where you got a lot of bad legislation because uh, the deep state knows that conservatives will vote for anything that has the, the name military on it. Yeah. And uh, as if that's always patriotic. But Donald Trump really should have wised up that the deep state is operating the foreign policy. They've created ISIS. They've created the, these terrors, terrorism. And he should have said, you know, we're going to withdraw all our troops from Afghanistan. And he tried to do that. He got talked out of it. I tried to get them out of Syria, and now they've gone back into 11 out of the 18 bases now, even the ones, uh, you know, around northern Syria where they left the uh, poor Kurds hanging. It's just incredible what he get. And I'm not sure they've even told him. I think these people go back into the bases at the orders of the Pentagon without telling the president. So he just is in a situation where he's experiencing being kind of helpless against all the people really giving orders, right? And that's because, as I explained, he doesn't have any arguments. He doesn't have any experience fighting the deep state. He, and to his credit, and I'll go through this in just a few minutes, he does talk back with his briefers. Sometimes he doesn't agree with them. And in fact, uh, let me go to that, for example. Um, this was from Susan Gordon, who was the deputy director under da National Intelligence Director Dan Coats who talked about briefing Trump. And she said, former Deputy of National Intelligence Susan Gordon publicly described what it was like to give intelligence briefings to Trump, noting how he routinely expressed deep skepticism and often refused to believe the findings. Quote, I'm not sure I believe that, Gordon said, quoting a very common response from Trump during her intelligence briefings, which she said took place two or three times a week. She also said he typically asked questions that reflected his background in business and having never served in public office. Quote, why is that true? Why are we there? Why is that something? Why is what? Why is this what you believe? Why do we do that? Now, conservatives took great heart upon reading this, thinking, wow, the Trump is really battling these people and really, but he isn't. This is truly a unique and rare view of how the insiders view Trump, but don't take too much stock in it. His instincts caution him not to accept everything, and he says so. But he hasn't any experience, any evidence, any arguments to counter what they're saying. Believe me, these briefers are experts in having superficial explanations or even lies to back up what they're telling Trump. Right. Without knowing conspiracy history or what the deep state is currently doing to arm and support terrorists around the world, including ISIS and Al-Qaeda, he cannot compete with these briefings. Now, Trump's only real success so far in the foreign policy has been not going to war with Iran. So far, he has resisted three false flag operations by the deep state and Israel blamed on Iran, which is laudable, but not stable. He's running on gut feelings and doesn't know anything about the secret false flag operations by the deep state that created these incidents. But there will be more to come, I guarantee you. The next time the deep state will surely kill some Americans and that will trigger Trump to go to war with Iran. Not, not encouraging with the explanation of how superficial some of this knowledge is or how it's completely missing, but... I, again, just to clarify, on the on the southern border wall, that's in in the Constitution. It says that the president has to protect against uh, invasions, right, along with insurrections. And if you have to wait and ask permission to protect against an invasion, that would be the end of the country. So how can that stand? I mean, why would he go along with that? And is that the truth? Well, you see, that's what I said in the World Affairs Brief, that he had the wrong basis for emergency powers. His basis for emergency power should have been his constitutional duty to protect, not only against invasion, but he has a constitutional power to protect the rights and property of people on the border. Right. Which Including are, immigrants, right? of course. That's right. And so... He had the wrong excuse, and when the courts ruled against him, he should have been able to say, no, I'm not going to accept that. 
I, it's clearly my constitutional duty to do that, and the courts are out of their jurisdiction, so I'm not, I'm not going to obey the courts. Just cite the Constitution, right? That's right. Now, that would have been a basis for impeachment. The Democrats would have jumped on them in, so to defy the Supreme Court would be a basis for impeachment. But it would have established a precedent for a president, and FDR did. FDR told the Supreme Court to take a hike when they overruled his um, uh, what, New Deal. And so he packed the Supreme Court. Nobody suggested impeaching FDR at that time. Right. But let me list Trump's failures and bad decisions. He succumbed to various small compromises with the anti-gun lobby, including banning bump stocks and favoring red flag laws. Yeah. Trump's biggest failures have been not stopping globalist intervention around the world, not halting deficit spending, and not draining the swamp. These are big three things. I would have included a failure to stop illegal immigration. Most of that isn't Trump's fault. All the rest is his fault. Twice he assigned trillion dollar plus spending bills, including this last week, giving Democrats everything they want as long as they give him a few things. He made NSA spying permanent so they no longer have to come to get a certification to spy domestically. In foreign policy where Trump has no clue about the deep state secret operations in support of terror, he, he continues to be driven by false flag operations used to justify attacking or staying in other countries. His good instincts make him skeptical of these things, but because he's got no body of knowledge on conspiracy to back up his instinct, he always gets talked out of his skepticism. He has been talked out of withdrawing from Syria and Afghanistan twice. He's even been talked into sending troops or sending in tro thousands more troops into the Middle East, specifically Saudi Arabia. Even as he brags about bringing a few troops home, who actually never did come home, they got reassigned to Iraq. Well, he did, he did bring the two parties together by trying to get the troops out of those countries because both parties were totally against it to block him, right? Right. Republicans and Democrats were against that. And the reason, of course, the U.S. has no intention of leaving Iraq is they, that's where they run the, terror, the terrorist arming and, um, and funding operations out of the embassy in, in Baghdad. That's where they run all the secret supply chain where they fly in weapons to Syria and Iraq through diplomatic cargo using Silkways airlines. He's improperly bombed Syria twice due to false intelligence about Syria using chemical weapons against his own people. Right. And so, you know, it's, it looks very, very bad uh, on that. Uh, I am still very upset with his inability to be a good judge of people. And, you know, what's an interesting contradiction is that even though he has some good instincts about what's right and wrong about immigration and locking up Hillary Clinton for, you know, the email scandal. Yeah. He's a terrible judge of people. You know, he praises to the moon Kim Jong-un. He praises Vladimir Putin. He praises, uh, praises Recep Erdogan. And Xi Jinping, one of the greatest butchers of the world, with the greatest con number of concentration camps. And he bashes Bashar al-Assad, who's a mild-mannered Western-trained uh, ophthalmologist. Yeah, and, so. he, and Iranian leaders based solely on the negative briefings he gets of them. Now, the Iranians are not good people, I will admit. Uh, they are... Um, Islamists, um, but the people don't deserve, you know, these kinds of sanctions that are happening there. And um, now you mean the Iranian leaders, I assume, because I've met mean, a lot I, of great Iranian people. I meant the Iranian leaders, you know, but they aren't out. They're actually mostly defensive. Uh, you know, they are not the biggest terrorist sponsors in the world. The U.S., Britain and Saudi Arabia and Israel are the biggest terrorist sponsors in the world. Iran is the biggest sponsor of the terrorists or of the fighters fighting U.S.-backed terrorists, such as in Yemen and Lebanon. Right. He praises everyone, as I said, including the Clintons. Um, and I, I think his skewed conscience, you know, when you're immoral with many women and things, you have to, you selectively choose what you want to hear from conscience. And so you get penalized, I think. 
Well, but you also said it was his fault that he didn't train the swamp so far. And and it's like, you know, the examples are with in the debates in 2016. He told Hillary, yeah, because if I was president, you'd be in jail and remarks like that. And do you think anybody in his position could have actually drained the swamp, making it his fault that he didn't? Well, no, I really don't. Because, you see, what he does have control of is who he nominates to replace deep staters like James Comey. Yeah. And because he doesn't know anybody in the conservative movement. I mean, you can't go in and ferret out these people who are deep state because you'd have to get NSA surveillance documenting their conversations, proving that they're tra traitors to the country. And the NSA would never give you that data. They would deny it was there. But at least you could replace Comey with a, a true conservative. You could replace Bill Barr with someone like Bill Olson, you know, who's a great conservative lawyer who's been before the Supreme Court many times now. Right. The, and the true test that it would be a non-deep stater is the Senate would come up in arms about him like they did with uh, Robert Bork and never let him get past first base towards getting on the Supreme Court. to be. Yeah. So because the deep state controls the Senate, they control about 75 percent of Congress, all of the top judges, all of the law enforcement agencies is very difficult, if not impossible, even for me with my knowledge of the deep state to clean it out because they just simply wouldn't allow you to get the evidence. And even if you had got the evidence, the, the judges would probably not rule in, in favor. They would vote to not to convict. So that's, what you're describing is a conspiracy that's much deeper than even the conspiracy theory people imagine, which right. is probably the reason that you're demonized if you believe in any kind of conspiracy, because that's basically all there is, with a few exceptions. That's right. It's, uh, it's much more serious than what people think, and that's why in my career, and we'll talk about this next time, I still believe in fighting the good fight of alerting as many people to the dangers of this deep state conspiracy, which is deadly. It's not just a bunch of Obama bureaucrats trying to get rid of the president. Right. It's deadly. And I just don't think we're going to beat them. I don't think we're going to win back our freedom as a nation as a whole. But I do think, you know, the Lord blesses those who prepare and fight for liberty. And there will always be pockets of liberty. And that's why I preach both the doctrine of fighting the deep state as well as preparing for the takedown, preparing for the loss of liberty, preparing for this third world war. You've got to survive the war in order to live, to uh, build up liberty a different, uh, another day. Right. And you don't know in advance what form grace is going to take. So you do what you can now in case you get support that you don't expect, you know, right. from higher sources. And just in case it fails, then you do what you're talking about. Well, one of the things that I am sure the Lord will do in the next war is that he will take the opportunity of the chaos that is in these high-density urban areas to drive out the good conservative people remaining in that area for their jobs because there's no more job. They'll drive them out. And that's one of the reasons why I wrote the book Strategic Relocation to help people plan ahead for where are safe places, where are conservatives going to gather, where can we build up new majorities of conservatives, because even the globalist New World Order will have to play lip service to democracy. Right. And, and, they, and just to clarify, when you say conservative, you don't mean the definition of the term that the Democrats use to demonize. You're talking about really good people. That's right. I'm talking I mean, about... Good it, people who are relatively blind still, or who may see, but who cannot leave because of finances, job being tied to the city, or don't have the faith to make the leap into more rural areas to find a job. Is, I'm not so what do you mean by them being driven out? What does that mean? I mean that when there is a Mad Max scenario in these major cities because of EMP, which will precede the nuclear strike on military targets. I'm not saying that nuclear bombs will fall on the cities themselves, but they will hit all the military bases, and that will affect, with fallout and social unrest, all the other cities. There won't be any trucks traveling from New from California to supply the, the nation with food. There's not going to be any electricity for at least six months. 
I mean, it could come on a little bit earlier in some areas, but it won't be fully restored for maybe six months to a year. And you can imagine what that will do. The Internet will be down. The television and radio stations are going to be down. And, you know, how much how many generators do people have? They just aren't prepared for what's uh, for what's coming. Yeah. Well, so you generators to, usually need fuel, too. Yeah. And so you have to stockpile fuel. And those things are difficult. I mean, I'm not a hypocrite. I believe in all the stuff I, I preach in, in the midst of uh, doing another uh, rural farm retreat uh, with fuel storage and other things. And it's uh, it takes a lot of labor, a lot of, uh, of cost, but you've got to work at it diligently in order to get things done. And there are things that people can do even when you can't do everything. And that's what we'll talk about in the next time is how people can prepare, how they can go forward without a sense of foreboding that there's nothing they can do and that there's no hope whatsoever. I don't think there's any hope for the country as, as a whole. In fact, I really think that the Lord owes Sodom and Gomorrah an apology if he doesn't chastise this country with consequences someday for... Selective enforcement, right? Yeah. yeah. So, if, the, if this scenario comes to pass and there's the EMP and basically that, you know, shuts down virtually all of society, which is now internet dependent and electricity dependent and things like that. Does that go in, in your view simultaneous with some kind of physical invasion at a time of weakness or just internal chaos? I, I believe it's just internal chaos. I don't believe that either the Russians and Chinese want to try to maintain supply lines for an invasion force all across these long oceans and deal with 500 million armed, well, 500 million arms in the hands of private citizens in this country. This would be a real nightmare to try to invade. There would be guerrilla groups rising up all over the place, constantly harassing them. So I don't see the invasion scenario as realistic, but I do see the internal chaos um, as the major threat that the, the people have. Now, before we close this session, I do want to end with my prognostication about impeachment of Donald Trump and re-election. Okay. I do not think that Donald Trump will be impeached, but I do believe that the Republican establishment is going to sabotage the impeachment uh, Senate trial by not calling any witnesses, by not focusing on the actual corruption of Joe and Hunter Biden and, and the rest, in this pay-to-play, the NGOs and the, N and the UN are involved. They would give millions of dollars to fund these engineers through Ukraine, and Ukraine would siphon off several millions for the sponsors of this legislation. And all this kind of secret stuff goes on. None of that is meant to be come out, and I think that's why Lindsey Graham and Mitch McConnell are part of the deep state. They're going to exonerate Trump in a trial, but they're not going to allow him to walk away with proving to the American people that the Democrats are really corrupt because that would put Trump into office in 2020. And I don't believe they intend to get let Trump get reelected. Now, the backlash is so bad on this impeachment that it still could happen. But I still, and my gut feeling is they're not going to, uh, because of vote corruption, because of continued illegal aliens voting and things, that they're not going to be able to, uh, harness enough voters to re-elect Donald Trump. And I think then the downhill really starts fast with our nation. Okay, and, and there's another big issue of why he wouldn't get re-elected, which is the ownership of the voting machines, right? That's right, yeah. Diebold and all these other voting machine companies are owned by the deep state, and they've got the pre-programmed to flip votes and things. You have to be very, very careful. Yeah. I mean, in 2016, looking at the size, relative size and enthusiasm at the rallies between the two parties, I would have guessed without preconception that Trump probably won the popular vote by about two to one or more. And I no, think that no, they no. couldn't imagine Look, that. the rally size isn't... It's the conservatives were the frustrated ones. They were the ones who were, uh, look, I mean, even just to show you how, how you can't tell these things, for example, I don't know if you would know this or not, but one of the major preparedness companies went out of business after Trump got elected. That was uh, Emergency Essentials, the largest preparedness company in the United States, huge warehouses and systems, and they literally went out of business. I saw their graphs. 
they went from Obama, if you can see my hand, in the, they went yeah. from the Obama up to this. And after Trump got elected, it didn't go down gradually. It de- went down precipitously. Because Trump was, I mean, Obama was a great salesman for preparedness and firearms, right? But you see, everybody bought into the illusion that Donald Trump was going to save us. So everything was fine. So everything was fine. And, you know, you ask anyone with a preparedness site and they are limping along because everyone is still believing that Trump will save them. And I'll tell you, he's not going to save us. He's not going to be able to drain the swamp. And I'm not selling anything in in preparedness, but I'm telling you that it's not going to happen. And once a Democrat gets reelected in 2020, I'll tell you, people are going to get concerned again. So to a certain extent, if the Lord loves the conservatives, he's not going to continue to feed them with this illusion that they're going to be saved. If we get another four years of Donald Trump and the failures that we've had in this first four years, by the time 2024 gets around, it will be too late to do anything. So, so that the corollary of that is that organizations like uh, Q are terrible for pr- the preparedness business. And they are they, they are really say everything. designed by the deep state to keep the Trump supporters believing in a fairy tale that the deep state is going to be prosecuted, that 35,000 are going to be taken to Guantanamo Bay and other things. I mean, yeah. Q is a pure disinformation. And I, it angers a lot of people when I say that. But I'll tell you, he continues to be absolutely wrong. Yeah, I completely agree with that from the beginning. So, um, on one level, you're not painting a very optimistic picture for the future, obviously, right? If the country as a whole is not going to survive. But um, I guess next time when we get into solutions and responses and what could come afterwards, maybe that's somewhat of a silver lining and could end up good in some ways, right? Well, it's still going to be hard. I'm not going to put any illusions. I want to tell you this from my 50 plus years in the preparedness, doing it myself as well as helping other people, I will tell you that if people live by false hope, they will not prepare. Right. So if you want people, if they want a feel good message that this is all going to turn out hunky dory, they will not prepare. And I'm not going to give them that message. Yeah. It's going to be tough even if you are prepared. So beware if you aren't. And not just for the U.S., because Canada and Mexico are not that far away. They'd be dealing with some of the similar effects of EMPs and things like that, right? That's right. Although Mexico lives on a much more rudimentary beans and rice diet that they can revert to much easier than Americans are used to going to the store for everything. Yeah, except for if you live in the middle of Mexico City or something like that. That's right. That's right. That'd be good. Okay, well, I'm looking forward to next time and and not for uh, unrealistic hopefulness of anything but just to see you know even even with things being hard it's good if people know the best way to use the time that they've got it is right so okay hold on and we'll say goodbye at the break here all right thank you so there goes joel skousen that was another incredible episode i thought i learned a lot i hope you got quite a bit out of it um the the things that that he had to his observations on Trump and the Trump administration were really interesting. I thought um, where the weaknesses lie, the the intent being good, and uh, the depth of the deep state resistance against uh, anything good that Trump would try to do really paints a picture that it goes deeper than almost. Um, any of the people who consider themselves conspiracy believers uh, really know it, it's a it's an amazing uh, network that goes into all these different aspects of, of the control systems of society. So um, next time, I think what we'll be doing is looking at what people again in a little bit more detail what they can do, and especially uh, Joel's commentary on intentional communities that he's had decades of work uh, experience consulting for the for them not only in in the u.s but in other countries as well i'm looking forward to hearing what he thinks about that already learned a lot from his his uh, comments up through the series and that'll be the i probably the conclusion of of what we'll put together at least at this point maybe we'll do some updates later on so in the meantime 
uh, we may have some other uh, exciting Sunday guests coming up that you need to stay in, uh, aware of, and we'll announce those as they get scheduled. Otherwise, we'll finish off uh, the last episode uh, next Sunday, if, if that's what ends up happening with the scheduling. Remember, too, that we're talking about a lot of things that really are not allowed to talk about, probably because not that many people know about us yet, but that's likely to change in the near future if the censorship doesn't get us you know, to disappear. If we do disappear off the major platforms that you may have been watching us on, remember, um, stay in touch with us at lostartsradio.com. Also, our uh, relatively new channel at brighteon.com, which is B-R-I, G-H-T-E-O-N, like bright, new new t- period or something, brighteon. And our, our specific channel there is brighteon.com slash channel slash Lost Arts Radio. And they've just opened up subscriptions. So it would be good to subscribe to Lost Arts Radio channel on Brighteon. We're on other platforms too, but Brighteon's really a good uh, substitute for the conventional video platforms because Mike's is doing a great job and they're not going to censor anybody. Um, so I, wanna, I wanted to tell you about that. Also that if you want to keep us on air, even if we don't manage to stay on the major platforms, please help us if you have the resources. Uh, we've got many projects waiting that can't move forward until we get the money for them. And we're not doing commercials as you may have known uh, noticed. So we need donations if not if you're struggling for survival, obviously, but if you've got the means and you believe in the kind of thing that we're trying to do, there's uh, a number of ways to do that. We have a new Subscribe Star channel. Uh, you can go to subscribestar.com slash Lost Arts Radio. We have donate buttons on lostartsradio.com and lostartsresearchinstitute.org, which is the nonprofit site that keeps us all going. Uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff there, especially under the tab Eldamar about the school that we'd like to start. If you want to be more involved in that or help support it, uh, you can always write to me for more details. That's Richard at lostartsradio.com. We also have the ongoing private platform, not as subject to censorship, where we can talk freely about a lot of things we can't mention in detail on the public platforms, and that is accessed at planetaryhealingclub.com planetaryhealingclub.com there are small dues we charge for that uh, there's a lot of value in it if, if you're ready to work on your own life and yourself and you're interested in life transformation at this point and the forbidden uh, information about health is freely shared there and consciousness tools to make it easier to apply in your own life uh, will I'll be there live every week and we can interact and um, those small dues all go to the nonprofit that helps us if we got a lot of members there that would help us in, with our other projects too toward building the school and all that uh, so check that out if you have questions about that whether that would be worth your while uh, feel free to email me and I'll respond as quickly as I can to those those inquiries I think that's most of it. Remember, we at this point, we still have a live show Saturday afternoon before the club meeting, uh, 4.30 Pacific time, U.S. time, 7.30 Eastern every Saturday, and then half an hour later, the private club meeting where we get in, in depth into some of these issues that we want specific information to get out to people on. Uh, so you're welcome to join us. You're personally invited. Uh, we need serious people to work on themselves for the sake of what we can do to change the future of what's you know coming up on the planet as joel is describing it Um, and just to work on yourself because if you're in good shape and you learn about what you can do for your own health and uh, life quality in general you'll do better through whatever is coming so we're sharing that information there planetaryhealingclub.com and I think that's about all the things I was trying to remember to remind you about. Thanks for spending your time with us. I really appreciate it. I know you've got a lot of other stuff to be doing. Um, we we'll try to give you as much content value as we can. If you have any suggested uh, show guests or people that you want us to consider having on or other questions or comments or suggestions, feel free to email them, richard at lostartsradio.com. And I think that's about it. Have a great week. 
and we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Introducing Lost Arts Radio on Subscribestar.com. Just go to Subscribestar.com slash Lost Arts Radio to find our rewards program offering 10 different giving levels starting at just 5 bucks a month. We offer incredible value for any rewards level, from extra monthly interview videos not available publicly to subscription-based Planetary Healing Club videos once, twice, or three times a month, to private counseling sessions with Lost Arts Radio host Richard Sachs, to tech help with me, Doug Diamond. We even have one option where you can be the star on Lost Arts Radio as our guest on a specially produced show just for you. We conduct an interview with you and broadcast it to our growing network and listenership. Our subscribe star levels are one of a kind and offer great rewards for any budget. Please help support Lost Arts Radio. We can't do it without you. With increasing censorship on many of our channels, we really need your support today to keep doing what we're doing. As Richard says, we're not even at survival level yet. Lost Arts Radio has three weekly shows. Lost Arts Radio Live each Saturday night at 7.30 Eastern, 4.30 Pacific, which is a live stream currently on multiple platforms in case we get banned from some of the larger ones. Right now, we're on two YouTube channels, Facebook Live, Periscope, which is Twitter, Twitch, and DLive. You can access these broadcasts by going to www.lostartsradio.com slash live for all the links to those channels. The Planetary Healing Club meets right after Lost Arts Radio Live at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific on Saturday nights. And our Sunday show with guests airs at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific on Sunday nights on our Blog Talk Radio channel, our YouTube channels, Facebook pages, and on Brideon. Be sure to sign up for our free email list just in case we do get banned on big tech's platforms. It's just a matter of time, really. They don't like the stuff we talk about, and they do not want the truth out there. In fact, they have already attacked us numerous times. Join our free email list so we can let you know where we are and how to access our shows. The sign-up button is right on the top right on most pages of our website. The best starting point for all things Lost Arts Radio is our main site, lostartsradio.com, where you can find the hottest news selection videos that we curate just for you. Those are on the homepage and added to daily, as well as articles and breaking news about information you really need to know. Our show archives, the 10 most recent shows, are right on our homepage, as well as our Blog Talk Radio page at blogtalkradio.com slash lostartsradio, or just click the All Things Radio Show tab right on our website. We're in the podcast directory on iTunes, and all of our shows except the banned ones are on our YouTube channels at Lost Arts Radio and at Diamond Disc. Our Brideon page is really taking off, and we often have editors picks videos right on their homepage. Visit Brideon.com slash channel slash Lost Arts Radio. On our site, you can also access our free listener forum as well as sign up for the Planetary Healing Club, which is just $25 a month, where you get private access to a one-on-one interaction with host Richard Sachs and myself and the other club members who participate live. More info can be found at planetaryhealingclub.com. We're providing solutions in there to make the world a better place. Come join us. Stay tuned because up next, you'll get to hear a really great song by an independent artist that we're doing our best to support. Go to lostartsradio.com slash music for the full list of all the great songs and bands that we spin on our audio-only podcast shows. If you're in a band and want to submit a song for consideration for airplay on Lost Arts Radio, visit my website at diamonddiscaudio.com for more information about the music placement, mastering, and mixing work that I do. Thanks again for listening to and supporting Lost Arts Radio. We love having you as part of our family to learn, experience, and grow with. Stars light.